thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. Uh, welcome to the annual lecture series of the Centre for Philosophy of Science. Before I introduce today's speaker, I wanted to say a couple of words about the lecture series itself. It was founded in 1960 by Adolf Grunbaum uh, and is uh, one of the longest continuously operating lecture series in philosophy of science. It might well be the uh, longest uh, continuously operating uh, series. So it is quite a series. I, I want to recall for you the people who spoke in the very first offering of the series in, <clears throat> in 1960. Um, Adolf Grunbaum started out by talking on the nature of time. Um, some of you might recognize these names, so listen for the names. Uh, Carl Hempel, uh, Hempel. Uh, oh, you've heard of him, good. Uh, talked about uh, the logic of scientific explanation. Michael Scriven talked about, I know what you're thinking, no, he talked about psychoanalysis. Uh, uh, analysis. Wilfred Sellers talked about philosophy and the scientific image of man. We've heard that phrase before, yes, isn't that something? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, Ernest Nagel talked about the structure of evolutionary explanation, and Paul Feyerabend talked about... Yeah, well, uh, uh, quantum theory. The, the reason I've, I've gone through this, this long list is that I want to say that this lecture series is the occasion that we uh, uh, recognize someone who has made significant uh, contributions to the field. It's our, it's our way of recognizing a new addition to the pantheon of philosophical gods uh, uh, with whom I've, I've just, <laughs> I've just <laughs> listed for you. And so it is a, a truly great pleasure uh, when someone who is to be added to that pantheon is a member of our own faculty. And so it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Masvita Chirimuta in our Department of History and Philosophy of Science. Let me just say a couple of words uh, about her background, if you will uh, permit me to, to, to do this. She has a bachelor's degree from Bristol in uh, philosophy and psychology and a PhD from Cambridge in the Department of, of Physiology. Uh, after she completed uh, that work, she traveled uh, and had appointments in Pisa in Italy. Monash University, you know where that is? Oh, you do? Down under. Down under in Melbourne, Australia, at Wash Lu and at the University of Birmingham. And then in 2011, it was our very great fortune that we were able to recruit her to come to the University of Pittsburgh. She came as an assistant professor and was subsequently promoted to uh, uh, an associate professor, which is the uh, rank she now holds and has been a, a treasured uh, member of, of our department. Her research looks at the relationship between neuroscience and the philosophy of mind and, and perception. She has specialized in color vision. Her book, Outside Color, published by MIT Press, was the subject of a workshop that we held here in 2006. And her latest research is on the topic of explanation in neuroscience. And I know you're all saying, tell me more, tell me more about that. And that's the plan for today. And that's going to be the topic of today's talk. So thank you. Well, um, yeah, thanks ever so much, John. It's um, yeah, a great honor. And I didn't realize that it was also a kind of um, apothe apotheosis as well. So that, <laughs> that surprised me. But a great honor to be invited uh, to give this lecture here today. Yeah, so um, this is part of an ongoing project on um, explanation in neuroscience. Um, but more specifically, looking at um, two themes in the philosophy of science that are kind of related in some ways to explanation. So I won't actually be talking so much about explanation today, um, but prediction and understanding. And this is something I first um, thought about about um, 15 years ago. So when I was finishing off my PhD in neurosciences, um, it struck me that there was some you know, possible um, concern to be had about the potential for growth in technologies around neurosciences, which would, um, so the increase of uh, predictive power of neuroscientific um, technologies, <coughs> the potential for increased control and instrumentality with res respect to the brain, whether that would um, somehow confer an illusion of understanding when we didn't actually have understanding of the brain. So this question of how um, prediction and understanding relate to each other was something that I thought about um, back then and the available technologies were typically pharmaceuticals and um, a question I asked myself was, you know, the fact that we can intervene on the brain 
using um, psychopharmaceuticals um, doesn't imply that we actually understand um, psych psychiatric pathologies, <coughs> but do we think we understand them just because we're able to um, um, make predictions about morbidity and, um, and disease outcomes on the basis of these uh, technological instruments? So in the 15 years since then, the field of neurotechnology has um, grown a lot. And there are all kinds of devices um, that have become um, popular and well widely used that I never dreamt of back then, um, including brain-computer interfaces, which I'll um, touch on briefly here today, um, uh, deep brain stimulation, all kinds of ways of um, manipulating the brain, which people never dreamed about. But the technology that I'm focusing on today is the use of um, machine learning tools to make very precise predictions about how uh, neural circuits are behave behaving and whether that sort of trades off against the understanding <coughs> of the brain. So this is the overview. Um, so in the first part, I'll be sort of just saying something about current debates uh, within, broadly speaking, the community of machine learning and artificial intelligence about this question of um, interpretability of models, and then connecting that with um, the literature and philosophy of science about um, the intelligibility of all kinds of theories and models in science, not just um, computational ones. Um, and then I'll be t using these case studies on the visual cortex and motor <coughs> cortex to talk about um, this divergence of prediction and understanding. And then um, in the final part of the talk, def uh, defending this uh, non-factive account of understanding. But yeah, to say a bit about the background context here. Um, so this was in, a, uh, news, in the newspaper just the other day. So the president of MIT um, writes in the Financial Times that artificial intelligence will de decisively reshape how all of us live and work together. It will help humanity learn more, waste less, work smarter, live longer. And what I particularly care about better understand and predict almost anything that can be measured. Um, so in this uh, promotional piece for um, both the College of MIT and the kind of work that computer scientists are now doing, it's proposing that understanding and prediction go together so that when we um, use machine learning to, um, to um, feed in large data sets and you know, predictions pop out about what would happen in um, new circumstances that that also confers understanding. So that's a really interest, well, that's a really significant claim that's being made. Um, but a couple of months ago, um, just to compare another view on this, um, in the Financial Times, one opinion piece was talking about this problem within management that um, hard targets, targets that could be quantified and uh, measured precisely, get a uh, privileged role above soft targets, the kind of intangible, unmeasurable um, qualities and things that would be relevant to the running of an organization. Um, and um, as he puts it, um, there's this tendency to pay more attention to hard facts, targets, outcomes, and initiatives than soft factors that are equally or sometimes more important. So what's the relationship between these two Things. Well, on the one hand, um, with this um, role of big data and machine learning, there is this privileging already of um, the measurable, because we cut, as um, the previous comment was, that if we can measure it, then we can predict it, but the unmeasurable things don't get predicted. But the thing that is uh, sort of more relevant to my talk today is that prediction, so when we're evaluating uh, scientific models and theories, prediction is a very tangible, quantifiable um, quality of, of the um, model. We can you know, say precisely how well this model predicts a certain phenomenon, but the um, quality of understanding is far less tangible and measurable. We, can't, we have this vague sense that understanding is a good thing, but it's very hard to pin down exactly what understanding is, and it's certainly not something that we can just numerically measure and say, you know, this model provides X amount of understanding. So if there is this sort of widespread 
um, culture at which sort of values um, hard targets over soft targets, then um, the parts of science which confer um, predictive power, which is a hard target, will themselves, you know, be potentially promoted over the parts of science that confer understanding. Um, so that, I think, is something to pay attention to when we're having discussions about, you know, what we want science to deliver um, in the future, given all of the new technologies which are available. So, now to lead on to the main body of the talk. So there's, um, with all of the um, like rapid advances in machine learning recently, um, one of the things that has been frequently pointed out is that um, these networks, um, as depicted here, are very good at sort of learning from data sets, learning to classify objects, um, but there's of, it's often not clear to the model builders um, what grounds these um, decisions are made on. Like how is it that this network has learned to classify cats versus dogs? So one of the um, things that people want now from these kinds of tools is um, explainability and um, in this case, um, the model is just supposed to report something to the user about what's happening here. Another kind of way of interpreting these models is um, be mentioned as visualizations. This is a very sort of fancy looking picture, but it came out of a project from Google where they built all these um, machine learning devices and they wanted to know more about how they worked. So they, you know, created some visualization techniques. Um, but on the background of this, um, people have been talking about how the interpretability of these models is a good thing, um, but there's no sort of canonical definition yet. Um, one thing that is quite central to lots of people's thoughts is that the models we use should be um, transparent, which is pretty much the opposite of being a black box or an oracle, something that just gives you an answer, but you don't know why. Um, it gives you this answer. Um, so my proposal here is that in the context of um, use of machine learning tools in science, um, it's useful to think about previous work that's been done on intelligibility. Uh, but to say a bit more about um, how these have been used in science um, so far, so one, um, uh, one initiative which was started during Obama's presidency was this brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies. So, as I mentioned before, there's been this fast increase in the number of um, possible um, experimental techniques which are available to neuroscientists. And also the amount of data generated per experiment has increased by orders of magnitude since I was a student. Um, so there are these large data sets which are um, a good thing in one way, but then it's much harder to model, you know, very large data sets than the smaller ones of the past. Um, so there's been this um, idea that neuroscience, big data neuroscience should integrate with machine learning. So Patricia Churchland and Terry Sanofsky are two people that have been talking about this. They write that we are on the brink of a new era of collaboration between systems neuroscience and AI. The breakthroughs in machine learning can be harnessed to find deep patterns and organizational features within gigantic data sets. But on a less optimistic note, another neuroscientist, Freniak, writes that to some degree, wishful thinking has replaced the conceptual drive behind experiments, as if using the fanciest tools and exploiting the power of numbers could bring about some epiphany. So you can certainly see there's, these are the opposite ends of the spectrum about like what is a productive way to go here. There is, on the one hand, this notion that yeah, big data plus machine learning is going to bring theoretical fruit. On the other hand, there's this sense that you might get something out of it, but it's not this thing that he, you would call an epiphany or a major insight into the system. Um, so if you take... Um, an artificial neural network which is being used to model data in neuroscience. The question is, is it just a black box, a predictive tool which doesn't give you insight into the system? 
Um, so one neuroscientist who's been um, at the forefront of using machine learning in neuroscience sort of voices this concern himself. He writes that machine learning provides us with ever-increasing levels of performance accompanied by a parallel rise in opaqueness. <laughs> and then um, two theoretical neuroscientists, Gao and Gunguli, write, each of these artificial neural networks can solve a complex computational problem. Moreover, we know the full network connectivity, the dynamics of every single neuron, the plasticity rule used to train the network. Remember, these are artificial neurons, not neurons that they're experimenting on. And they know the developmental experience of the network. Yet, they say, a meaningful understanding of how these networks work still eludes us, as well as what su a suitable benchmark for such understanding would be. Um, so, the question of a benchmark for understanding, this is where I think the work on um, intelligibility can come in. So, I'll just um, mention one philosopher of um, science who works more on problems in uh, philosophy of physics, has talked about, um, has some useful distinctions to be made here. So, as he puts it, understanding of a phenomenon requires <coughs> that the theory that we're using is intelligible to us. And it's relative to a context because it's not that a theory is intelligible per se, but it's intelligible with respect to certain scientists over other scientists. It depends on their training, um, the particular applications in, um, that they have in mind. So this is one of the sort of intangibles about this um, notion of intelligibility, that it is a context-dependent thing. It's not something that can be said that it's like a given for all time. So that's something to bear in mind. So this is the schematic that he uses. So this works for physics, where there's a clear theory model distinction. You have your fundamental theory, and you use approximations of that to model particular experimental systems. That gives you, hopefully, understanding of the phenomenon in nature. So Direct's work is, um, comes um, ultimately from a proposal from uh, Heisenberg that was then picked up by Feinberg, sorry, Feynman. <laughs> um, so this um, criterion of intelligibility um, sort of boils down to this idea that the scientist knows what the qualitative uh, predictions of the of the theory or model would be without having to crank out all the all the calculations. So um, yeah, so with this being <coughs> ultimately from um, Heisenberg's work on quantum mechanics, the idea was that you know when this when his um, work first came up, people would say, well, this is just a calculating device, but it doesn't, you know, give us a sense of what's going on in nature. It allows us to, you know, crank out the predictions of our experiments, but it's not giving us a picture of what's going on underlying in the physics. So this is why this notion, well, maybe if we can, you know, we know from our theories what, roughly speaking, is going to happen in different situations, then that's what we need uh, for saying that our theory is intelligible. Um, and this notion was actually picked up by um, Gao and Ganguly, the neuroscientists that I quoted from before, um, and they cite uh, fine, Feynman's um, use of this criterion. Um, yeah, so, so applying this to neuroscience, one thing that's important here is that there isn't a clean theory model distinction. Pretty much all of the quantitative work that, um, and theoretical work um, that goes on in neuroscience can equally well be described as modeling. So having experimental data and building models which um, can predict future experiments. So the question is, is this theory slash model that neuroscientists are building intelligible or not? And does it confer understanding of a phenomenon? So in this part of the talk, um, I'll give you a couple of case studies, um, which I argue shows that there's a divergence between these two goals or desiderata that we would want from our theory or model. Um, but one person who thought that prediction itself provides understanding was the illustrious Karl Hempel, the 
um, John just mentioned. So he wrote back in 1966 that a deductive nominological argument, his sort of way of thinking about what explanations were in science, um, shows that given the particular circumstances and the laws in question, the occurrence of the phenomenon was to be expected. And it is in this sense that the explanation enables us to understand why the phenomenon occurred. So generally speaking, philosophers of science in this tradition didn't think much of understanding because they considered it a rather subjective um, <coughs> to want from science, but they still, when they did talk about it, they related it to predictive power. And interestingly, this idea that prediction is tied to understanding is um, there in the neuroscience literature. Um, so Garrett Stanley writes that predictions about the external stimulus or be behavior that are generated from uh, running our model on some neural scientific data are a clear litmus test as to whether we truly understand the neural code. Um, so this like, general concept of um, decoding as the ability to predict um, um, how a neuron would respond to any given stimulus was, um, has been you know, current in neuroscience for the last couple of decades. In particular, this book, Spikes, um, was um, kind of popularized some of that work and laid some important theoretical groundwork. But the um, modeling of neural responses sort of goes way back to the uh, mid 20th century. So the first case, um, we're looking at the visual system <coughs> and experimental work that was first done in the 1960s, Hubel and Weasel, very well-known experiments done on the visual system of a cat where they recorded from um, primary visual cortex cells known as simple cells um, and they flashed up different stimuli on a screen, typically very simple stimuli like this um, oblique bar that you see depicted here and they would um, sort of collect lots of data about which kind of stimulus configuration um, was best at exciting a good response from the simple cell. Um, so they did lots of qualitative re uh, research on this, but the subsequent generations of neuroscientists did quantitative research, which was trying to take for each simple cell to be able to build a model which would predict how it would, would respond to any given stimulus. So the first generation of these um, kinds of models so I'm talking about not just uh, primary visual cortex, but also earlier on in the brain, retinal ganglion cells. So the first generation of these um, cells, of, of, sorry, of these models, assumed that the, um, the computations performed by these cells were essentially um, a linear summation of the light falling on the cell's receptive field. So the part of the receptive field is just the part of space which the cell, if you like, looks at. Um, so they imagined, they assumed that the cells were just like summing the amount of light in the um, excitatory part of the field, which is depicted in white, and then that it was inhibited by um, light falling in other parts of the receptive field, just adjacent to it. And then there was this firing rate nonlinearity, which was added to it. But it, in effect, it's a very simple um, mathematical description of the neurons. So this generation of model, it's good for making predictions about responses to simple stimuli, but it doesn't do well as soon as you make the stimulus a bit more complex. So just having not just one oblique bar, but another one um, next, like adjacent, crossing it, or even just slightly adjacent to it. So what these failures um, brought people's attention to was the fact that cells in the brain adjacent to any particular cell could be inhibiting it or you know causing other interaction effects typically inhibition so the second generation and this work starting from the 1990s sort of uh, put forward simple models of the population effects so for example Heger's normalization model imagines that um, a few surrounding cells in the population um, there's a pooled inhibitory effect which divides out the response of any given neuron. 
And that is, does really well for these um, slightly more complex but still artificial stimuli. So the like two oblique bars crossed together, for example. That does much better than the previous generation of models. But if you try and get it to predict the response of a cell to a much more complex stimulus, for example, um, a photograph of a real scene like this one, or a movie um, of an animal, of what an animal would see if it was wandering around, then these models start to show their limitations. So the most, the most recent generations are using these machine learning techniques where um, instead of sort of hand coding a function, which is what you think is the computation that the neuron would be performing, you train um, a deep network like this one to, with lots of data that you've collected from experiments um, about st stimuli and about the neural responses. So you build something which is good at making, um, very good at making predictions, including predictions about how um, the cells will be responding to uh, natural images. And I wouldn't want to say that this is just data fitting either, because this, these um, trade models generate pretty well to different classes of stimulus sets. So it's not just like if it's trained to certain kinds of black and white images, then it will you know, do well at predicting the responses of another image kind of similar to those. But actually, one of these models, which is trained to um, a stimulus set of white noise, which is, looks nothing like um, normal images that you see around you, still does a pretty good response uh, still goes, makes pretty good predictions of how the neuron will behave to natural images. So there is generalization across data sets, and that's you know, and a very important achievement of these um, classes of models. But in order to achieve this predictive success, you've built a very, very mathematically complex object, which has, you haven't um, you know, written the solution to the problem yourself, the, the machine has found it, it's found the solution by itself. And so there's this question there, what's it telling us about the brain? So this is a uh, quotation from an interview with a neurophysiologist, Adrian Fairhall, who writes, a lot of work I and others have done in the past tries to extract coding models of data. For example, to try to fit a receptive field to predict an output. With these emerging methods to analyze high dimensional data, rather than fit a receptive field, you train a randomly connected recurrent network, or that's just a different kind of network, to produce a certain kind of output. It's different than a simple receptive field model. You often get more accurate predictions of what the system will do, but maybe you're giving up on an intuition about what's going on. So we end up building network solutions that we don't really understand. So, so far I've been talking about understanding and intelligibility, but I haven't spelled out precisely what's missing as we go from the first generation to the third generation of models. So this sort of might help a bit just to sort of visualize the point that the first and second generation of models had sort of explicit mathematical descriptions of the cell's behavior. These were um, functions that neuroscientists came up with, often you know, using analogies from engineering. Um, they were this idea that a simple cell is a linear filter. That's an idea that came from analogy by engineering. And so they'd write down equations that looked like the kind of things that would fit their qualitative data. But with the artificial neural network, there is no... Um, explicit um, function that you can say that the uh, that is the model solution. There is, if you like, the function that um, goes from the stimulus to the response, but it's embedded in the network. And we currently don't have a means to extract the function from a network of the complexity that are being used here. So mathematically speaking, there is right now um, opacity. For simple networks, you could perhaps extract functions, but right now we don't have um, means to do that. 
And another thing is, I think, connecting to this notion of um, visualizability. So there are certain, if you like, neural architectures or, you know, guesses about how circuits are connected up in order to do the things that they do that were associated with the previous generations of model. But in something like um, the not neural networks that are used for the receptive field modeling, there isn't anything that sort of transposes to a hypothesis about how um, the visual system is built up in order to do this thing. I should point out that there are other kinds of um, uses of neural networks which are intended more to sort of map onto the structure of the visual cortex itself. You might have heard of um, Jim DiCarlo's work at MIT. But this kind of application where you're just using it to predict receptive field responses, there isn't any sort of anatomical or um, mechanistic information that's built in there. So this, situ so this sort of situation is what I'm calling this um, trade-off between understanding and prediction. So just to connect this to previous work in the philosophy of science on model building, um, it's nice to think about Richard Levin's work on uh, models in population biology, because he noticed back then in the 1960s that we have all these different things that we want models in science to do. We want them to be manageable, so that's easy to code and um, run on a computer. <coughs> we want them to generalize across lots of different cases. We want them to be realistic, by which he means that there's a good match between the models' um, predictions and the data. And we want them to make precise predictions. Um, but he says this can't all be done by one model. Um, and he gives examples of how they would trade off with one another in his um, field. So I think this is a further example of that. Also, Nancy Cartwright's work in uh, philosophy of physics makes this contrast between the fundamental laws, which are explanatory, and the models which are predictive. So I think there's a, also a connection there. Um, but thinking again of Levin's um, list, we could add intelligibility there. And then the... Um, and then the situation is as follows. The, the first generation of models, it's very intelligible, it's precise, um, as long as it's the quantitative sort. Um, it's manageable, it's, it's easy to code. Um, but as soon as you go beyond the simplest stimulus situation, it's not particularly realistic. Um, and then the third generation, you see the opposite pattern. It's very precise predictively. Um, but you're losing on the intelligibility. So just to um, make the point that it's not an isolated case, though uh, we, we couldn't be all here all evening, like giving you more and more cases, but I will talk about um, one other example of work on the motor cortex. <coughs> and um, in particular, um, the neurophysiology um, that has been going on as basic research behind um, brain-computer interface technologies. So one um, technological goal in, um, in this area is to be able to read off um, from an individual... I'll just get the pointer out here. Right here. Yeah, so to take recordings from a person's brain and to be able to um, use that to decode what they're intended to uh, movement was. For in particular as a um, prosthetic device for people who are paralyzed um, so that they can interact with um, devices like computers but potentially also control a robotic limb in the real world. So to actually give a gateway out from the brain to a device in the real world. Um, but the neural data by themselves, they don't tell you so much. So you need to run it through a decoder which I've depicted as a gray box here to be um, non-committal about its um, transparency or opacity. So the decoder, the computer program sort of feed in the data and it spits out a guess about how the person wanted to move. Um, so a 
what I'm calling the first generation here. I should mention like these sketches of first, second, and third generation. I'm obviously missing out vast ways of research, but this was very foundational. So I'm just going to begin here. Um, it's known as the uh, population vector algorithm. So this is, in, at heart, it sort of looks across a population of neurons in this brain area. And um, given a um, given knowledge of what their preferred direction of movement is, um, for any given um, pattern of neural activity, it will sort of sum those um, responses and like, tell you this person intended to move in this direction. There are plenty of assumptions packed into the algorithm, for example, <laughs> that there is this linear relationship between um, um, uh, preferred like, um, movement and like how how steeply the firing weight drops off as you move away from the preferred direction. Um, it assumes things that about the coding pattern um, and this uniformity of distribution of tuning preferences, saying that there are as many neurons in motor cortex for this direction as for this direction, things like that. Um, so these assumptions are an explicit part of the modeling framework. Um, and also, we can test these assumptions for validity. And actually, it turns out they're um, only roughly true or sometimes false. But at least they're explicit. Um, so another generation, a subsequent generation of decoder sort of um, relaxed the assumption about um, number three, about distribution of tuning preferences. So this allows for there to be a non-uniform direction of tuning preferences, but it's still essentially a linear model. But it adds a more fancy smoothing method, so it does um, sort of give better results in the decoding experiment. But there's also new work which uses, uh, in this case, recurrent neural networks, networks which have um, feedback loops built into them, to perform this same decoding problem. So this is from um, Chenoy's group in um, Stanford. And what's really important here is these are hypothesis-free networks. So there's no assumptions built into them which then could be tested. Um, you're just training them on lots and lots of experimental data. And they argue in these papers that they give really good predictions of what the behavior will be. I don't believe they're currently used for actual sort of decoding technology, but it's just a nice sort of proof of principle here. Um, so I think in this case, the question of intelligibility or the understanding um, conferred by these modeling projects sort of really boils down to like whether there are explicit assumptions or not. And the point being that in this case, there aren't explicit assumptions, so you don't know what the network is assuming about the brain in order to make the predictions. Okay, so just to sort of sum up again. Um, so these first and second generation models, say they misrep, arguably they misrepresent the cell's computations once you go beyond the very simple experimental situations. That's why they're not predictively accurate but they are intelligible. But the third generation models, their predictive set success, we will assume, um, one might want to query that, but we'll assume it's because it gives an accurate representation of the cell's computations, um, but that accurate representation is kind of embedded in the network, so we don't know what it is, so, but we'll assume that it's somehow found the function that the neuron is computing. They're not currently intelligible, but I do leave it open that they could become more intelligible in the future. So really my claim is that they'll always be relatively less intelligible than the previous generation of models. So that's what I mean by this trade-off, that you're never gonna have a model in neuroscience that scores maximally well on both of those things that you want. A possible reply here is that the ANNs will become significantly more intelligible in the future. So people might want to claim that, well, in a few years' time, they'll just 
be as intelligible to the neuroscientists as the old generations of models are. So I don't want to deny that there is a lot of important work being done at the moment on reverse engineering these models. So I have a few references at the bottom there. Um, but what I would say is that they're always going to be far more mathematically complex than the previous ones. So there's always going to be a certain barrier. Remember, intelligibility is a context-dependent thing. So the average neuroscientist is not a um, mathematical expert as well, or a computer science expert as well. So even if the model um, was very intelligible to the best machine learning person in the world, the average neuroscientist is not going to have those skills. Um, so to talk a bit more also about this reverse engineering strategy, um, what people are doing is <clears throat> taking like a trained model and then trying to do, if you like, do mini experiments on the model itself to actually figure out how the model is doing things. So instead of like trying to work out how the brain is doing something, you have your trained model and then you try and figure out how the trained model is doing things. So people are hoping that that will generate hypotheses about how the actual brain is working that then they can use to test on the actual brain. And that could be a very fruitful line of inquiry, but it's still, there's still a certain indirectness to that. Um, and yeah, it's not, by indirectness I mean that it's not a simple, it will not be a case there of you just having your experimental data, you have a model that fits it and you can work out what the model is, you can see what the model is doing and then that directly explains your experimental data. Even if people follow these kinds of steps, there's, it's a more roundabout route to understanding. So I would say, yeah, that's still less intelligible than the previous direct approach. So you might be wondering, how does the um, idealized representation of the simple cell as essentially a linear filter confer more understanding of V1? So this is something you might be worrying about, because I've said that there are these inaccurate or unrealistic models of the brain, which do have this virtue that they help us understand the brain. But if they're not true, then how can we say that we've understood the brain? in virtue of using these models. That seems paradoxical. Um, so this is where this notion of non-factive understanding comes in. So the core idea of non-factive understanding is that you should think of understanding as achieved by a compromise between um, things in nature that are mind-bogglingly complicated and human beings who are limited um, as Bill says, we only have so much space in our heads to think things out. And if you just look at something which you think of as as simple as a C. elegans, a tiny worm, and look at its few hundred neurons wired together, even that connectome seems to have this like, very challenging causal complexity um, manifest there that we can't just take in all of that complexity in nature and straightforwardly understand it. So understanding is, if you like, this process of cutting nature down to size such that we um, can understand it. And that's typically done by abstraction and idealization. Um, so one philosopher of neuroscience, Angela Potochnik, sort of writes about this in her recent book, that idealizations are rampant and unchecked in science because they aid understanding. Um, Catherine Elgin also points out that understanding is conveyed by felicitous falsehoods. So it's not that any old untrue description of a system will yield understanding. It has to have something, um, as she puts it, felicitous about it. There has to be, you know, of all the possible untrue descriptions of this thing, it has to be the right one that is not, yeah, not so wildly off that it's completely misleading. Um, but still helpful. So I noticed the clock ticking, so I'm not sure how much of the next stuff I should go to. Um, other than to say that 
there are some objections to non-factivism. So other philosophers of science say that, uh, ultimately speaking, you can only um, use your model to understand a system if your model is approximately true. And then the bits of the model which are clearly factually incorrect about the system, they're just there for pragmatic reasons, but that's not really what's helping you understand the system. So, I mean, one thing to say about this is that I think the notion of approximation is slippery in this context because like, you can always say that this, whatever horrible nonlinear function is discovered by your artificial neural network approximates to a linear function, but I don't think you would say that that approximation is really doing any work there because it's just so, you could say that about anything, it's not really a meaningful claim. Um, I think more specifically, like if you compare the data that I showed before about the neural responses on the top there and these linear fits, would you want to say that they're approximately linear because there is the same trend from red to blue? Uh, maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. Um, but I think there is a deeper weakness in Potochnik's account of non-factive explanation. Because as she puts it, ultimately, um, she relies on this notion of a real pattern, which I don't have time to go into now. But I'll just put it out there that she does think that what a idealized model latches onto is some pattern that is really out there in nature, but is masked by the data. And so she says, yeah, I'll just to sum up here. So what I think we should do is actually think more about the way that um, in the process of designing experiments and processing data, we don't just discover patterns that are out there in nature, but we actually in some way generate patterns. Um, so the previous slide had this notion from Dennett of a real pattern, but also Dennett has this idea of a pattern which is the product of like some random event and some filtering process that you do yourself, which creates these like hard edges in the pattern, but they're not there prior to data processing. And I think that could well be um, relevant to thinking about these examples in neuroscience. So if you just look at lots of neural data, there's kind of patterny stuff there, but through these steps of averaging, you create, if you like, hard edges, um, which are then the target of the simple models. Um, so um, that's one example there. So I will I can talk more about that in the Q and A. But here are the conclusions. Um, so, to say that there is this trade-off between prediction and understanding, which is better explained by a non-factive account of science. Understanding is this compromise between, um, between the limitations of human scientists and all of that complexity that's there in nature. So, going back to this question that I started out with, like, if it's non-factive, why is understanding still important? So, so going back to what I said at the start, like understanding um, is somewhat intangible. I've tried today to say some more concrete things about what understanding is, um, how it relates to the intelligibility and interpretability of models, but it still can't be quantified in the way that predictive accuracy can be. It's still gonna be, if you like, a soft metric rather than a hard target. Um, and as such, it's easily taken to be um, dispensable. I mean, furthermore, in my account of non-factive understanding that I gave you just then, there's a certain sense in which you want to say, well, we have this understanding of a system, but there's something artificial about the understanding because it's understanding of a simplified experimental system which, um, which has generated this data, which has gone through processing, which again smoothed out some of the complexity which is there in the natural system and it filters it out and so yeah this thing understanding do we really actually want it at the end of the day
So, in the last couple of minutes, I just say why I think um, we shouldn't give up on understanding. So there is this, um, this paper I like to think about by the historian Peter Deere, who asks the question, what is the history of science the history of? And he's <clears throat> talking about you know, science in the Western tradition, beginning um, in his timeline with Francis Bacon. And he says a characteristic feature of it is this interaction between natural philosophy, which is the project of observing nature in order to try and understand it for the sake of understanding, like a disinterested wish to understand nature. And that is combined with the project of um, instrumentality, so putting knowledge of nature to use in creating technologies which humans presumably will benefit from. And he emphasizes the contingency of this connection. Like, previous, like prior to the 17th century and in other parts of the world, people didn't think that there was an obvious connection between natural philosophy and instrumentality. These activities went on, but they weren't combined in the way that they are in science in the modern Western tradition. <laughs> so that's an interesting thing, that we think of science as just, that's what it is. That because of our familiarity with science as it is, we think of these things as naturally related to each other. But maybe, according to Deere, they're not. So it seems like we're at this point, if you know, machine learning tools and science sort of take off in the way that they're predicted to, that we're going to move out of this area that we're used to, where there's, there's this alignment between methods for understanding and for prediction and control, and go into some uncharted territory over here where there's this divorce between methods for understanding and for prediction and control. What we're really seeing here is that the methods for, under, for prediction and control could become much more powerful than our methods for understanding. And the thing that is sort of to be um, discussed here is like whether like, we should be happy with this untethering from understanding this intangible thing of understanding. Um, so one concern here is that well if you're sort of driving ahead without any sense of, that you're understanding the system there could be lots of unknown unknowns and unknown unknowns tend to bring with them unintended consequences so that's something to be concerned about. Um, and yeah, it goes back to my sort of opening remark about um, you know, um, neuroscience and whether just having technology makes you think that you understand something when you don't. And it could well be that because we're used to current science, science as we've seen it up till now, in which um, instrumentality and technology just goes together with understanding, that when we actually have something in which they come apart, we might not realize that we haven't understood. And so not knowing that you don't understand something um, when actually you don't understand something is not a good thing. So that's the end. That works based on the old factory uh, mm -hmm. system rather than people were understanding the visual system. We get a bunch of really interesting properties out of the machine learning system. Uh, so that's constrained in, in a more logical way. We also have the more sort of piecemeal understanding that Bill was talking about. I, I think we've got an understanding of how these systems respond to different information and contexts. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, maybe it's, it's, it's not quite right to say either we've got like the engineering framework or we've got you know, uh, uh, a lack of understanding. That's one, that's one tool we have to sort of try and emulate slowly on, on the other system. Yeah, yeah. So I, the, the trade-off is not an either or. So certainly in a trade-off situation, you can have um, something that partially satisfies one desiderate and also partially satisfies another. And there's plenty of reasons why you might want to do that with machine learning, like build a simpler model, which isn't as predictively good, but is a bit more transparent. Um, so I'm not saying that that is not an option for scientists. Um, but yeah, for the purposes of illustration, I sort of gave the most clear-cut cases, but yeah, at the end of the day, I, I do think that there is a trade-off that we're not going to be able to maximize both of these things at once with any given model, and that was, but Levinson's point was that, you know, 
with one model alone, you can't do everything. With multiple approaches, you might get a workable theory of B1, which does well both on prediction and on understanding in some sense, like putting all the pieces together. You might have something like that. But this concern about the role of neural technology here is that, like, if, and then going back to the stuff at the start, like, is there a possible scenario in which, like, predictive power, because it's so impressive, like, gets in a positive feedback situation where I say, this has been really good, but let's do more of this, let's do more of this, because there is this very tangible payoff, which there isn't, um, you know, that you can tell your managers and, you know, grant people and stuff with, yeah, but this really helped me understand the thing, but, like, what have you predicted? Well, but I understood the thing. So in, in that kind of situation, do we get positive feedback on the predictive side? Then the goal of understanding might diminish. That said, most scientists go into science because they want to understand something. So I think it's just up to the people doing the work. I don't think they easily forget that they want to understand the brain. Um, but there's all kinds of policy and technological goals around neuroscience, which could create that drive towards um, technology by itself. So we run out of time. I've got three minutes left on my watch and the queue I have is Mahi, Angie, I, sorry, I don't know your name behind. behind Murray. You. Sorry, Murray, okay. And um, are you all, and then and then we're back to you, of course. Uh, are, we, are we all, are we all in? So Mahi, you would go next, but you might well be the last. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the talk. So um, I just wanted to, kind of get back to this distinction between the first and second generation models of the first mm -hmm. to understand like what the real difference is there right. in terms of understanding. Because yeah. I can understand how you're applying in terms of ability to understand it. But right. I'm just wondering where the intelligibility of the understanding comes from the first and second generation ones. Mm -hmm. Because to some extent it seems like it's just because of the colonization. But mm -hmm. I, I I'm just wondering like does the colonization of this get me that understanding of so by quantization you mean that it's mathematically transparent and yeah, quantitative? So you can express it in a mathematical way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, so the intelligibility is sort of situation relative. So assuming that the scientist has the skill set to understand the maths in those kinds of transparent models, then yeah, that um, would control it. But then there are other things that I think are also, um, but why I, why I think this is important in these situations in theoretical neuroscience is that those previous generations of models were inspired by certain theoretical hypotheses about what the function of those areas were. So in particular V1, like the first guess was that it was doing a Fourier transform on the scene, um, on the visual scene that you see. So it's doing this kind of frequency discrimination. And so there are these things, oh, well, maybe that's what it's doing. And, you know, there are now people don't think that, but that was at the basis of why they were so interested in this linear hypothesis at the start. So the fact that they had a transparent mathematics that could then fit into some theoretical guesses was important, yeah. My apologies to those of you who are still in the queue. Uh, we have run out of time. Um, uh, Ms. Vita is going to be lingering, so you will yeah, still have a chance to connect with her. And now we need to move to our closing ceremony. So, Thanks. Ms. Vita, it's my honour and pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, you're, all, you're all wondering if we have prepared an embarrassingly sumptuous banquet for you. I'm pleased to say that we are going to spare oh, you the embarrassment. Uh, and we have some light refreshments for you, so please, please join us and join those yeah. videos. Just outside here. Yeah. I'm sitting there and I'm seeing umbrellas, which they're not. And then they got that came up. That's all. Just crazy, right? <laughs> the umbrella they never work. But when you, put the, when you brought the umbrella, I decided, I decided those were umbrellas. I I decided these were all the brothers back there. I know when you gave her that. No, they come back unless you're prepared. Good, good. The circuits are loaded at that point. Just give us like 10 minutes. I can watch it. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
understanding mechanism. That's why I'm in the physical, this is part of the part. And I'm not satisfied. So there's a main.